<laughs> All right. John 4.24 says that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. <laughs> My wife's over there <laughs> And in truth. And, of course, that refers to being under the filling of God the Holy Spirit and in the divine dynasty, the only place, of course, where doctrine can be understood. Therefore, before we start our study this evening, we're going to go ahead and give every believer priest both the opportunity and the privacy necessary to make those decisions to ensure residents in that sphere to allow for a proper study. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again, from your perfect faithfulness, you've recognized our every need and our capacities, and in fulfillment of the plan that you've provided for us, you've given us yet another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. Then, as a result of its application, to develop capacity, capacity for love, capacity for life, capacity for happiness, for blessing, for service, and of course, the capacity to handle the problems and pressures that you know are in immediate future. We ask now that God the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us self-discipline, concentration, genuine humility, and anything else we might need for a proper study. And as always, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're doing a Wednesday class, which is the introduction to the Old Testament. Uh, we've gone through all of point one. Point one was an overview of the structure and collection of the Old Testament. It started off with understanding inspiration and the origin of the, the, the uh, information. And we got 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21 as a corrected translation, which says, <clears throat> and yet we keep on having the more reliable prophetic word regarding which you do honorably while paying attention to it in your heart's slant right lobes as you would pay attention to a lamp shining in a dark place <clears throat> until the da day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart's slant right lobes. Uh, above all, keep on knowing this, and we saw the information about this, that all prophecy of Scripture did not come slant originate through the instrumentality of one's own, and that's the prophet's own interpretation. For you see, prophecy was never brought through the instrumentality of the will of man, but men spoke from the ultimate source of God, being led in, by the Holy Spirit. So that tells us very, very clearly the, uh, the concept of inspiration. And then, of course, 2 Timothy 3.16 said, All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training related to righteousness. And then we saw information associated with early writing. We saw the fact that language, first of all, had to be created, and then that we had uh, language and writing associated with, uh, in the Egyptian time, hieroglyphics. In the uh, Babylonian, we had cuneiforms, neither of which would be able to give us uh, the, the uh, written word of God. And so uh, God uh, inspired mankind to develop an alphabet. And the first alphabet, of course, came through uh, Jewish uh, 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 lines. That's why it's called an alphabet, because it's the alpha and bet, and bet which are the, the two letters, first two letters of the Jewish alphabet. And the fact that you could take the 30 some odd characters and turn them into words and then words into thoughts and thoughts into, into uh, language uh, gave us the capability to actually have the written word of God. Then in point two, <clears throat> we started a study of canonicity. We saw first the collection of the Hebrew Bible. We saw the Palestinian collection, which is the law, the prophets, and the writings. And I give you, uh, as you see there on the screen, each of the books that fits into that. We saw some information then concerning some ancient collections, uh, how they were organized. We saw an organization given by Josephus. And Josephus was important because he, he gave the idea that the canonicity had to have some form of measure. And the measure was what we call propheticity. We saw that there was three parts uh, in almost all of the breakdowns, uh, in all of the organizations. In fact, the uh, Septuagint, the LXX, also had three parts. And then we saw uh, various lists associated with Origen, Eusebius, and Jerome. Uh, we uh, then uh, went through a uh, <clears throat> difference between the traditional Hebrew Bible, referred to as the Palestinian text, and other Bibles. We saw the Qumran, we saw the Samaritans, and the Alexandrian Jews. And then in subpoint C, we started canonicity proper. We saw that canonicity in the collection and organization as we know it today 
We saw the fact that canonicity is a Christian term. We don't talk, uh, until Christianity, we didn't talk about canonicity. So the Hebrew Bible became a Hebrew Bible as a standard, but uh, they didn't call it the Hebrew canon. Uh, it isn't until we actually got into the, uh, into the Christian usage of the word, but we can still now call it the Old Testament canon, okay? We saw that canon equals a rule or a norm. And of course, the primary rule, as far as uh, the true canon is concerned, is that the books were written by prophets. <clears throat> we saw that the Palestinian Bible is prophetic. And the, again, the Old Testament is consisted, consistent with the Palestinian Bible as opposed to any of the others, like the Qumran, the Samaritan, or the uh, Alexandrian. That then got us into a discussion of the Apocrypha, which is where we are. I thought we'd be done tonight. We may not make it all the way through tonight, but uh, we'll be pretty darn close. We saw that the Apocrypha are the books that are left out. We've got a definition, and the definition comes from uh, Apocry Apocry sure. Apocryphos, uh, meaning hidden, concealed. Okay, We don't know exactly. <clears throat> it became a technical term. The exact reason that that term was used has been lost to time. Uh, there's 15 writings in total. Uh, first and second Esdras, Tobit, Judith, additional chapters in Esther, the wisdom of Solom, Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, a letter of Jeremiah, the song of three, Daniel and Susanna, Daniel, Bell and the snake, the prayer of Manasseh, and first and second Maccabees. <clears throat> We saw that only eight of these books show up in the Roman Catholic uh, Bible, which is, is the Bible that the only Bible that has the Apocrypha, and, uh, or the only well-known Bible that has the Apocrypha. There are pockets of, of uh, Protestant, if you will, Christianity that have, uh, have uh, um, recognized the Apocrypha. But we saw that, that some of the books were left out because First and Second Ezra and the Prayer of Manasseh were not canonized by the, uh, by the uh, Romans. Uh, Roman Catholic Church, and then the other, uh, the Song of Three, Susanna, Bell, and the Snake are actually part of Daniel. <clears throat> so point two, we saw that the first books considered to be canonical were the five books of Moses or the Pentateuch. That was a review, basically, but that gave us an idea of how it grew, and we saw that the last book came into existence around 435 B.C. Uh, <clears throat> we also saw that uh, from the standpoint of literature outside of the Old Testament, uh, the, the, uh, we can see that the belief that divinely authoritative words of God through his prophets had clearly ceased. Okay, And so in 1 Maccabees, and Maccabees itself uh, proclaims not to, be a, not to be a scripture, although it is uh, actually accepted in the Apocrypha, uh, tells us that, uh, the, uh, the, it, th that it was written after the time of the prophets. Okay, And then we saw Josephus once again giving us the current Jewish viewpoint. Point three, then, we saw the New Testament view of the Apocrypha. The fact that the Apocrypha was not accepted by the church during the time of Jesus can be deduced from the following. We saw that Jesus and the authors of the New Testament quote various parts of the Old Testament scriptures as divinely authoritative over 295 times. But not once do they cite any statement from the Apocrypha as being scripture. And then in point four, we saw that the church fathers also refused to accept the Apocrypha as part of the canon. And, church, and point four is actually where we are. We got point A. Point A said, as stated earlier, these books were included by Jerome in his Latin Vulgate, translation of the Bible, completed in A.D. 404. But in so doing, he stated that they were not, quote, books of the canon, end quote, but merely, quote, books of the church, end quote, that were hopeful and useful for new believers. By including them, Jerome guaranteed their continued accessibility, but the fact that they had no Hebrew original behind them, and their exclusion from the Jewish Bible led many of the church fathers to re rightly reject their authority as scripture. Now we're ready to pick up with subpoint B. <clears throat> subpoint B says the earliest Christian list of, quote, Old Testament books, end quote, that exists today is by Melito, or Melito, M-E-L-I-T-O, comma, M-E-L-I-T-O, Melito, 
Bishop of Sardis, S-A-R-D-I-S, comma, writing circa A.D. 170. Now, if you remember, Josephus gave us the earliest list of the Jewish canon in about 70 A.D., okay, or, or a little bit before that, but uh, Milito is uh, referring to the books that are in the Old Testament, which are the same thing as the Palestinian, uh, this Palestinian list, and his list was uh, more complete than Josephus's. Remember, Josephus gave us the, the fact that there was a list, and he gave a list of, uh, in three parts, and he had uh, 22, I believe, was what we had saw, uh, what we saw books in his list, and so he did not include everything, but Milito uh, ha you know, has a list that is much more complete. Okay, so writing circa AD 170. In his list, Melito doesn't name any of the books of the Apocrypha. But he does include all of our present Old Testament books, with the exception of Esther, period. Subpoint C. The lists from Origen in Eusebius, remember Origen is O R I G E N, it's a man's name. From Origen in Eusebius, mentioned earlier. give the Old Testament books including Esther comma but none of the apocryphal books are listed as canonical canonical, part of the canon. So none of the apocryphal books are listed as canonical. And in fact, the two books of Maccabees are said to be, quote, outside of these canonical books, period, end quote. Subpoint D, there should, there should not be an N right here. I fat fingered it. There's no N. The guy's name is Athanasius, not Anthanasius. Athanasius, comma. The Bishop of Alexandria, comma, so Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, 
listed all of the current books. in both the Old Testament and New Testament. With the exception of Esther. He then went on to say that the books of the Apocrypha are, quote, not indeed included in the canon, but appointed by the fathers to be read by those who newly join us, comma, and who wish for instruction in the word of godliness, period, end quote. This may have been done since many of these apocryphal books give information related to historical martyrs and other events prior to the start of the church age, period. So basically, basically what uh, theologians uh, think that he was trying to say was when he's talking about the word of godliness, and he used a small g on that, not that that was a, a standard at the time, but the idea is that his, his, uh, uh, his uh, instruction was primarily as examples, right? And since it included a lot of information associated with martyrs, the idea being, see, this is how godly people lived, and so you could be a martyr, uh, you know, and, and uh, this, is, this was his instruction on godliness, not doctrine, not godliness from the standpoint of functioning properly with regard to becoming a mature believer, okay? So we have a pretty good selection here. As you can see, the dates go all the way from 170, and then you have uh, 230, 1, 325, uh, 330, you know, 367 and 404. So you have the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth centuries, right? And so the idea is that is that uh, 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 the the uh, time period that if these things truly were prophetic and truly were, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of should be recognized as part of the canon, those who were closest to them would have recognized them as part of the canon, okay? And they didn't, uh, <clears throat> okay? Point five. We're going to get one one exception here. Point five, one notable church father did accept the apocryphal books and he is Augustine, period.
subpoint little a. Augustine himself recognized that the Jews did not accept these books as a part of their canon. Period. See, what's interesting is these books, the apocryphal books, think about the time period we're talking about here. The apocryphal books were written before the church age started. They were written before the books of the New Testament, which, which means that they were written by Jews. <laughs> okay? And so the Jews themselves didn't recognize the books that were written by Jews as part of the canon. Yet Christianity, uh, certain uh, sects of Christianity uh, have accepted them, have tried to accept them. Okay? Subpoint little b. I know there's a lot of history here. We're spending a lot of time on the apocryphal books. And one of the reasons may be the fact that I've got, where I work, I come into contact with uh, so many different Catholics. Okay, but uh, it's good background information for you to, because you never know when you're going to run into somebody that says, oh, well, this book says such and such. And you can say, no, that book doesn't belong. <laughs> you know, well, Tobit says, oh, yeah, well, Tobit doesn't belong, you know, or Baruch or Ecclesiasticus or anything like that, right? Uh, <clears throat> depending on the circles that you travel in. Okay, so point B. Augustine erroneously, E-R-R-O-N-E-O-U-S-L-Y, could be erroneously, it's probably the, the better pro pronunciation, although the dictionary shows both. So Augustine erroneously reasoned that these books should be in the Bible got to turn this off My hand radio friends uh, just managed to make a contact in Slovenia, so <laughs> he's, he's showing me all these pictures. Anyway, Augustine erroneously reasoned that these books should be in the Bible because of their mention quote of extreme and wonderful suffering. of certain martyrs, period, end quote. But if that were the basis for inclusion, Then, quote, foxes, and that's F-O-X-E apostrophe S, foxes book of martyrs, end quote, which is actually a pseudonym for a book entitled, whose real title is Acts and Monuments, and Acts is spelled A-C-T-E-S, okay? But it's been known in theology mostly as Fox's Book of Mar uh, in Christianity as Fox's Book of Martyrs. But if that were the basis, then Fox's Book of Martyrs, published in 1563, should also be in the canon. Period. See, a canon is a rule, right? It's a measure. It's a, uh, it's a criteria. It should stay the same <laughs> forever. 
right? We're talking about the, uh, the uh, truth of the word of God that exists forever. You can't go willy-nilly uh, changing the measurement and saying, oh, well, this time we're going to include this because the measurement changed, right? Uh, for us, an example of that is, you know, a, 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 in, in for very long now, not at its very beginning, but a foot is a foot is a foot, right? Uh, your foot, if you go and measure something at a foot, uh, you know, it should be the exact same length as what I measure as a foot. Right? I'm not going to go to uh, Home Depot and buy a foot of wood that's uh, equivalent to your six feet right? <laughs> and tell them to only charge me for a foot because that's what I have as a foot. No, we have a cannon, we have a rule, we have a ruler. And so if they're going to use the, uh, the idea that it talks about suffering of martyrs, well, then, okay, this book, which is a well-known book that describes all the suffering of early Christian mar martyrs as well as Jewish martyrs, okay, would also be included in the canon. So uh, that eliminates that as a measure, okay? But that's what Augustine used. Subpoint C. Augustine himself was inconsistent in that he, quote, rejected books. not written by prophets, comma, end quote, yet he accepted 1st Maccabees which denies being written by a prophet. I didn't know whether to just tell you this point or to have you write it, but since I've got it up here, we'll just go ahead and write it. <clears throat> he may, it's a point little d, he may have mistakenly accepted the Apocrypha because of his initial mistake of accepting that the LXX Septuagint was inspired. Comma. Which contained the apocryphal books. In later years, as he matured by matured I mean matured in, in his uh, 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 Christian understanding okay in later years as he matured he realized his mistake but never went back to recant his acceptance of the apocryphal books. Period. So the thing about Augustine <clears throat> was that, unlike Jerome, Augustine uh, uh, didn't know Hebrew, okay? And he, so he relied, on, he relied on both the Greek and the Latin. And on the Greek, he, he uh, relied on the Septuagint. He believed that it was inspired. He later learned, of course, and realized that it was not. Uh, you know, but, but it was based on his uh, improper understanding of the Greek and the Latin that he uh, assumed that uh, the apocryphal books uh, should be accepted. And then, and then, like many people, okay, once you've come to a decision, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to find reasons to justify your decision, 
right? And so part of his reasons may have very well been that, oh, well, gee, this has so much information about the suffering of the martyrs, it's got to be inspired, right? And, and then go on from there. And then later, when he realized that he was mistaken, now he was a very important church father. He never just, he just didn't bother to go back and say, oops, I was wrong, which is a bad thing to do on his part. Part of being a mature a believer is recognizing your failures and moving forward, okay? Admitting them and moving forward. Sub so point six. In addition to all this, by all this I mean the fact that they're not written by prophets or accepted by the early church, universal, okay? So in addition to all of this, there is also the fact that the apocryphal books contain doctrinal and historical errors which are not associated with typographical or clerical mistakes. For example, colon. <clears throat> so if, you're, if, <laughs> if you recall, a month ago, when we actually started the class, or two months ago, and we were talking about errors, and I talked about, uh, you know, and I gave you some examples of errors, they were all associated with something that was either typographical or clerical. For example, we had the fact that uh, uh, someone was indicated as having been born before his father was born in, in one case, right? And we saw that that was just a, that was just a typographical, because later on, uh, they had the dates correct. Okay, and so it had actually been corrected in many of the English translations. They just, uh, you know, took the correction and applied it to the English translation. We saw the issue with the uh, number of horses associated with chariots and the number of horses that uh, uh, the individual may have owned, right? And was it, uh, I forget whether it was 2,000 uh, versus 20,000 or 4,000 versus 40,000. Okay, <clears throat> you know, uh, and we saw that, you know, that was, that was more likely a uh, clerical error in that you could very quickly deduce what that was. That's not what these mistakes are. These mistakes are not clerical errors. They're errors associated with uh, both doctrine and history. Sub point A. Both Judith and Tobit contain historical, comma, chronological, and geographical errors, comma, and they justify falsehood, So they can contain historical, chronological, and geographical errors. <clears throat> and they justify falsehood and deception as proper, period. And if you're sharp, you could say, well, wait a minute. You know, in the time of Joshua, you know, the books that are part of that are that are canonical, uh, do, you know, define uh, falsehood and deception as as being proper. They tell Joshua to do things that uh, you know would would be trickster if you were, if you wanted to use a word. Okay, yes, but remember, in those cases, he was acting as a spy, and they were in the process of taking over other countries. <laughs> okay, so when you're talking about acting as a spy, uh, having deception is the way you stay alive, and so uh, uh, that's proper. What Judith and uh, Tobit do, though, is they justify uh, falsehood and deception almost as an end justifies the means. Okay, so uh, they don't they don't do it in the in the uh, in the context of spying or in the context of something that would be biblically justifiable. Okay, uh, through doctrine as we know it. 
Okay? Continue the point, one more sentence. They also make salvation dependent on works of merit. Period. And if you recall, when we talked about James and whether James was canonical or not, uh, we saw that it took a while for the book of James to actually be accepted as part of the uh, New Testament canon. And one of the reasons why is people misunderstood uh, the fact that we were talking about justifi justification by works, right? And so they were looking and they said, well, wait a minute, Judith and Tobit and some of the apocryphal books were, were uh, uh, refused as canonical because they talked about uh, uh, salvation being based on merit. And it sounded like James is being based on merit, right? I mean, it sounds like James is teaching that salvation is based on merit. But what we had to do is we had to understand, and remember, we took some time to define what uh, justification by works meant. It didn't mean that you, were that you were justified or saved because you performed works. It was the other way around. It was that you were proving that you were justified, okay, and that you were saved by the types of works that you created. So there's a big difference. Uh, you aren't justified because you're good, right? Good little boys go to heaven, bad little boys go to hell. We know that's not true. You aren't justified because you're good. The idea is that you're good and moral because you have the key of the, uh, of the uh, doctrine associated with, with uh, being a Christian, and therefore you're going to be good because you're saved. Okay, remember that was kind of the whole, the whole the context of, of moving around. Once that was understood, then, the, you know, then James was understood to be, uh, be a book that's, that is canonical. In this case, these two books uh, clearly teach that you are only justified by, by performing acts of merit. Subpoint B. Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, but Ecclesiasticus, And the wisdom of Solomon promote a morality based upon expediency, period. So it's another one of the ends justifies the, marine, the means, okay? If it's expedient, do it, and then you'll, uh, you'll uh, consider it to be moral afterwards. Subpoint little c. The wisdom of Solomon teaches the creation of the world out of pre-existing matter. See, that's in contradiction to Genesis, which tells us that uh, uh, the, 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 the universe, the world and the universe were created out of nothing. Okay, uh, matter was created, <laughs> not that the that the 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 world and universe was created out of pre-existing matter. Subpoint D. Ecclesiasticus. Teaches that the giving of alms, A L M S. makes atonement for sin. Period. Sound familiar? Say 10 Hail Marys, 3 Our Fathers, and give 20 bucks to the church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Give, give 20 bucks to the church. <laughs> now, Ecclesiasticus teaches that the giving of alms, A-L-M-S, that's money, makes atonement for sin. Period. 
subpoint little e. In Baruch, B A R U C H, it is said that God hears the prayers of the dead. Period. You ought to, when you're dead, you're face to face with the Lord. <laughs> but, you don't need, but you don't need to be making prayers. <laughs> okay? You have a conversation. You don't need to be making prayers. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm giving you these as examples because we have a couple more points, and later on, you're going to see that these became just a little bit of a history. Those of you that have studied the church history, homeschoolers, for example, uh, that, you know, that uh, the idea of uh, Martin Luther and Martin Luther breaking away from the Catholic Church. Okay, many of these things were the things that uh, convinced Martin Luther that the Catholic Church was wrong, right? Uh, there weren't prayers for the dead. You didn't have indulgences, which were essentially the equivalent of buying people out of purgatory, okay? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, or alms, giving alms for the, uh, for, to pay for sins, right? You know, that's what, that's what he, uh, he uh, uh, revolted against because he could not justify it biblically, and he was absolutely correct, right? And so the things that he nailed to the door that we talk about include those kinds of statements, okay? And the last one, subpoint F, 1 Maccabees, like Judith and Tobit, has both historical and geographical errors. So 1 Maccabees, like Judith and Tobit, have historical and geographical errors. Subpoint 7. Subpoint 7 is going to be exactly what I just said, <clears throat> but... <clears throat> In a, in a much, much easier fashion to get down, okay, and with a little bit of history. It wasn't until, so sub point seven, seven single parents around it, it wasn't until 1546, comma, at the Council of Trent, comma, that the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm going to be using that phrase a lot, so I, I would suggest you abbreviate it RCC. And the reason I, I give the whole thing is because uh, whether you know it or not, Catholic doesn't just mean the Catholic, the Roman Catholics. There, there is a, a different definition for the term Catholic. So when you're talking about the, the church that's based with the Pope, you have to actually call it the Roman Catholic Church. And so you can figure out how you want to abbreviate that, but it's going to be there a lot. And I don't write it out longhand. Okay, so it wasn't until 1546 at the Council of Trent that the Roman Catholic Church officially declared the Apocrypha to be a part of the canon with the exception of 1st and 2nd Esdras, that's E-S-D-R-A-S, -E and the prayer of Manasseh, M-A-N-A-S-S-E-H, period. So it wasn't until 1546 at the Council of Trent that the Roman Catholic Church officially declared the Apocrypha to be part of the canon, with the exception of 1st and 2nd Esdras and the prayer of Manasseh. It is significant that the Council of Trent was the response of the Roman Catholic Church
to the teachings of Martin Luther. and the rapidly spreading Protestant Reformation. The books of the Apocrypha support the Catholic teaching, or the Roman Catholic teaching. Of prayers for the dead. And justification by faith and works. which Luther rejected. The decision of the Council of Trent has all the appearance of an attempt to provide, quote, infallible support, end quote, for Roman Catholic doctrines that truly lack any real biblical basis. So what you see is a reaction, right? Martin Luther says this stuff isn't biblical, and uh, the Council of Trent says, well, you know, they, they, they accept the, Apoc the Apocrypha as, as a canonical, and then they can say, well, yes, it does. Here, look, it's in all of these books. Right? And, uh, and therefore, don't listen to Martin Luther. Uh, he's wrong. We're right. Uh, we are the infallible Church of Rome. Okay? Sub point eight. I'm going to go back just a little bit, like 100 years. Even before Martin Luther, the Council of Florence. And you can put in parentheses 1442, which was another local church council. Had proclaimed the Apocrypha. as being inspired, comma, which helped to bolster
the doctrine of purgatory, so which helped to bolster the doctrine of purgatory. that had already taken root and blossomed in Roman Catholicism, period. We recently planted grass in the backyard, so you're going to see a little bit. Of <laughs> we have taking root and blossoming. <clears throat> okay, we're taking root and blossoming. Yep, and then we're going to go on. Okay, that already taken root and blossomed in Roman Catholicism. However, the manifestations of this belief. Via the sale of indulgences. And indulgence is spelled I-N-D-U-L-G-E-N-C-E-S. And an indulgence was when you would, when, uh, see, if they believed in purgatory, what they said was, well, you weren't good enough to go to heaven, right? But you didn't go to hell, so you're in a temporary holding ground, okay? So you're, you're in this uh, uh, cattle, cattle uh, uh, corral, if you will, right? You know, uh, awaiting something to happen, right? And that something was your... Uh, uh, ancestor, well not your ancestors, your uh, predecessors, were uh, supposed to, uh, of course, pay money, that's what the indulgence was, pay money to the Roman Catholic Church and then the Pope would issue an indulgence and then you could get into heaven. See, you're, you're, uh, you didn't have a one-way ticket, you had a layover. <laughs> and, and you were on standby until such time as uh, uh, someone paid for the other half of the trip. Right, uh, and uh, that's very similar to uh, uh, some concepts of today. The Roman Catholic Church still does it, uh, but you have other uh, churches that require certain, uh, you know, certain things to happen before you can be totally saved, or before uh, the dead relatives of yours can be uh, 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 totally saved. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that's what we're talking about here. So, however, the manifestations of this belief via the sale of indulgences came to full bloom. Huh? <laughs> we had root and blossom and bloom. Anyway, came to full bloom in the time of Luther and the Trent Proclamation including the Apocrypha That's given above, right? Was a clear reaction against Luther's teachings. We have time for one more point. So, what do you have? You have the typical thing of religion. You have all of the uh, frailties and all of the uh, money, money hungry, power hungry uh, people corrupting the truth of the word of God. And so they, they have a way to make money. They uh, see a way to make money and they're going to try and turn it into the truth of the word of God. It's the exact same thing. See, that was the exact same thing as what we had with televangelists that would say, God told me you need to give the church more money. Right? Uh, you know, I, if I didn't say I heard it directly from God, then, you know, you wouldn't be stupid enough to believe it. But if I say I heard it from God and you're stupid, you'll believe it. Right? And then, and then you'll give me money. Okay? That's what the televangelists uh, well, banked on. Well, that's what the Council of Trent was saying was, look, all this stuff that we've been teaching you, and Luther said it's, it's hogwash. Right? There's no biblical basis. They said, yes, there is, because we accept these books that teach it. And since you don't accept it, then you're not a good Catholic, and therefore we're going to try to do everything we can to kill you. Okay? <clears throat> Sub point nine. By affirming the Apocrypha, as being a part of the canon, comma,
Roman Catholics are asserting that the church has the authority to constitute a literary work, comma, of their choice, comma, as scripture, semicolon, whereas Protestants, comma, of which Orthodox Christians such as ourselves fall, comma, have always held that the church cannot make something scripture, but can only recognize what God has already caused to be written as his own words, period. And one of the books that I was that I was going through, and, and as part of this background, uh, had a really good analogy. What they said it, was, it would be like saying that a police investigator can recognize counterfeit money as counterfeit, and can recognize genuine money as genuine. But of course, he can't make counterfeit money to be genuine, nor can any declaration by any member or any number of police officers make counterfeit money to be genuine. It can't be made something that it's not. Only the official treasury of a nation can make money that's real money. Similarly, only God can make words to be his very own words and worthy of inclusion in scripture. And so it's the job of the church to recognize the, the uh, scripture and recognize the counterfeit just like it was the job of the, of the uh, individual treasury investigators or police investigators to recognize uh, genuine versus counterfeit money. Okay, that leaves us ready for, uh, there is a point 10 and an 11 and that's it. Uh, and then we will actually be ready to go through the, go to uh, uh, some important information about how to study these books, and then we'll go through the books, okay? So I, I, I had said last week that we would get through it this week, uh, the Apocrypha, but we didn't, and uh, I was honest and said this week that we probably wouldn't. So anyway, okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to continue to study this information and this history associated with canonicity to help us to understand and have a very firm foundation and a complete grasp of the truth of your word and to understand the importance of the truth of your word and recognizing your word as truth and only your word as truth and to be able to have the confidence to use it to under, well, first of all, to understand it, then to use it, and to be able to uh, be ambassadors with it. And for that, we are truly grateful. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.